we're going to be considering the truth of our creed and the truth of the Apostles' Creed, the ecumenical creed of all the churches of Christendom. And it's the truth that I believe in God, triune, and God who's my Savior God, revealed in Jesus Christ. And especially the truth of the fact that Jesus was crucified is what we want to worship God, uh, is what we want to consider now in our worship of God. Jesus Christ was crucified. And all that that means, and even as our catechism reminds us in Lord's Day 16, it means Jesus suffered hell and forsakenness of God that we might go to heaven who believe in him and that we might never be forsaken of God. And so an outstanding Psalm of the Cross we want to consider, Psalm 22. Let's read that together to ground all the teaching that we would give from this pulpit in the Word of God. And I'm going to read the first 21 verses at this point. Later on, in the middle of the sermon, I want us to read the last part of this psalm. But here, the first 21 verses, but not quite. 21, and we'll stop halfway through the verse. But this is... Uh, Psalm 22, God's word to the chief musicians set to the deer of the dawn of this. I don't know what that means, but it's a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You may be trust while on my mother's breasts I will cast upon you I was cast upon you from birth and from my mother's womb. You've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there's none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And it seems that he's describing himself as a little piece of neglected pottery chipped off in the roaring furnace, the kiln. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You've brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. That's as far as we'll read. Psalm 22 says here, Psalm of David. Surely this is a Psalm of Jesus Christ. Messianic Psalm, as we can tell from the clear references to Calvary. Jesus, according to the Gospels, was nailed to the cross. 
the church confesses he was crucified means he was nailed to this Roman cross which became and was the cross of God to inflict even the curse, his wrath upon his own son for our sake. So you have here these references to the people who were holding Jesus in reproach and casting him in their teeth and cursing him and mocking him. You have here a reference to Jesus' feelings, as it were, what he felt like on the cross. And the ultimate was expressed in his fourth word in the darkness of the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We want to consider this too. We want to consider this truth of the cross of Calvary in light of Psalm 22. And we want to uh, entitle this sermon, The Cross and the Congregation. Because you'll find here in this very psalm, congregations. There's the congregation of the wicked. And they're gathering around the cross and having put him to death and now mocking him. But there's also this great congregation that is assembled by the grace of God because the one forsaken is heard of God and he lives. And so cross and congregation. First of all, we want to consider the segregated son, the one cast out of God, pushed aside, forsaken of God. At the same time, we want to consider this segregated son, forsaken son, in light of the Holy Father. And second, we want to consider this congregation of bulls and dogs and, and wolves and so on that gathers around raging and roaring at the son who is crucified. And they're called a congregation, the congregation of the wicked in verse 16, which has enclosed the son and pierced his hands and his feet. So what's that all about? And we want to consider that somehow, in God's own will, this was a congregation of his own ordination, so that even these wicked are serving the purpose of God. And finally, we consider with happiness the great graced congregation which God has made us to be and made many to be, even gathering us from the ends of the earth. So the segregated Son, the Holy Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? King James. Forsaken means forsaken. Jesus is crying out on the cross in that for fourth word in the midst of the darkness that had descended upon the land. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's recorded in the New Testament in the language of the Hebrews or the Aramaic, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. I wonder if sometimes we should just keep it there in that language. Because sometimes I think we rather quickly and superficially say, oh, I know what that means when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I know what that means. Catechism students raise their hands. And the preacher says, yes, you have it right. And we all have it right and we know it. But you see here, Jesus didn't know it. Why, he says. And we pretend to know it. Let's be careful. We're entering into the holy place. Jesus was really forsaken. Some people say, no, not really. He just felt that way. I don't want to stop that short. For in a sense, yes, he was not fully forsaken. He didn't end up in hell forever, because that's what hell is, being forsaken of God forever, cursed. Well, Jesus was heard. And yet, let's not stop and just say he just felt like it. There's a reality here. Jesus is not lying. His feelings do not betray him. They do not take him from the truth. They are expressions of the truth. 
Forsaken is forsaken, as Jesus says in the New Testament. And, and as nobody can understand and as he cannot understand. Why? Why have you forsaken me? And forsaken means simply he's bearing the curse here. The curse that is symbolized in his being hung up on the cross. This is the Roman instrument of the, the torture, the excruciating death of especially nasty and notorious criminals. It was not really a, uh, a death for Israel. Uh, it wasn't a punishment for Israel to the death of the perpetrators of certain crimes. However, the dead bodies of certain criminals in Israel, according to Deuteronomy 21, were hung on a cross for a little while to symbolize that they were cast out of God and of Israel. But this one, this crucifixion, the Son of God had to endure while he lived until he died and gave up the ghost. So there's something special about this. In fact, it's this. God himself is declaring his Son outside of his own fellowship. God is casting him to where all sinners go. To hell. That's what hell is. Heaven is being with God. It's not sipping tea, playing golf and whatever you want, being with all your friends. Heaven is being with God and his friends. Heaven is being with God and Jesus Christ revealed. Heaven is praising God and serving God forever and ever, not bored, uh, bored doing this, as we sometimes are in church, but thrilled, enthusiastic, praising God in the great company of the exalted just men and women made perfect by the Lamb. But Jesus is cast into hell, and hell means there's no God of fellowship, no opportunity to fellowship with God. No chance, as we would say it. God, it's not that God is not there, you see, in hell. He is, but only with his roaring wrath. Only saying, sinner, sinner. And nobody being able to deny it. No excuses. No putting off things in hell. It won't be, oh, well, I didn't know all this. You knew. And God is calling us today to look at the one who's forsaken that we might never be. Because this is what we know is going on here. We know that in this son who's segregated from God and from men, there is a God who's showing his love here. And he's showing his love for sinners. And he's showing his love and his justice together because the segregated one is the substitute one. That's what's going on on Calvary. And when we say he was crucified, we quickly must say he was crucified for me. That's the gospel of Calvary and the forsaken son, the segregated son. According to the strict justice of God, someone has to die. Sinners have sinned. They've shaken their fist at God. You have, and, and I have. The head of the, the human race, Adam, did, and we all fell in him and became guilty of this unmentionable sin of defiance of our Creator. And Jesus here is in our place. Because, you see, there's no one who's perfect who can satisfy that justice of God and say, I'm going to keep the commandments of God and, or I'm going to bear the punishment of God that I deserve and then I'm going to get up and dust off the, the blood and so on and live now. No. Nobody dusts off the wrath of God. He's God. He's holy. He's almighty. And when he shows wrath, he crushes the object of his wrath. He destroys he, he casts them out. And that's why hell is called a burning. 
to burnings of fire. And it's an inside fire and it's an outside fire and there's maggots and things and all the things we can imagine that consume you from within and worms that die not and so on. And it's terrible, the excruciating anguish and the consciousness that you have been under the wrath of God and not escaped. Jesus is the substitute. According to the justice of God, according to the love of God. You see, our creed is, I believe in God, whose love. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's, and it's all this. He loves me. Know that. But still know the question, why? That's very important here. We got the catechism answers right. We got the creed right. And it's not just reformed. This is the creed of any true church. I believe in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And it's a God thing you see on Calvary. God must be God and can't just wink at sin and, and avoid being God. But he's showing himself in his holiness, his justice, his love, in pressing his own son out of his fellowship outside of the camp. But again, this is a question. Why have you forsaken me? It's a harder one, I think. It's maybe the hardest question that's asked in the Bible. Remember, by the way, you should know this. The Bible is full of answers and there's questions. And not all the questions are wrong. They're not all of skeptics. Here's one of them. Why? Jesus says it. And I think a lot of true religion is tarnished. We say we have all the answers and there's no questions left. We got it down. We got it down. What Jesus didn't. That's what this text is saying. And reverence lead us to go in his way. Remember when the Israelites, they received this thing from heaven? Manna. And they named it manna. You know what that means in the Hebrew? What is this? <laughs> they, they ate it. It was good for them. Had all the necessary ingredients and vitamins and so on. They didn't need meat vegetables, they had manna from heaven. And they said, this is so marvelous, what is this thing that appears every morning and that's just enough for every one of us and so on and uh, two amounts for us before the Sabbath day so that we don't have to defile the Sabbath. What is this, they said. Here it is, but what is this? We still don't know. Well, when Jesus says this, this is the question of questions. It doesn't seem to fit. For just consider. The first Adam, Adam, real historical man, Genesis 1, 2, 3. He's made so wonderfully, children. He was made in a special way. On that day of creation, he was made. He was made out of the dust of the ground. And then what did God do? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became this image bearer of God, reflecting God's own holiness and righteousness and love and truth and God's servant. What a wonderful creation, not an animal, not an evolutionary product, but the hand of God making the man of God who would, should, and could have led the human race into the service of God and the magnification of his name, but he fell. That's Adam. Jesus Christ is called the second Adam, and look what, ha look what happens to him when he's forsaken, when he's crushed. It's like he's crushed out of existence even as a man. For look what happens to him. He's He's so crushed, he's forsaken of God, and he's crying out to God, and they're crying out to him, the, the mockers, um, uh, that, that he would be delivered. And verse 6, he says, but I'm a worm and no man. He's not even a man anymore on the cross. The second perfect Adam 
the sinless Son of God, to whom is imputed our sins. So he's made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, the representative of sinners yet without any mark in him, all for love's sake, is now no man. He's just a worm, lowliest of the lowly. You think of this. He's the light of the world. At the time he's crucified, the darkness is upon him. And one profound commentator beautifully says this, God says to us, the sun shines upon the good and the evil. But in the three hours of darkness, Jesus was not considered good, not even evil. The sun was out. He's less than evil. Amazing, forsaken of God, the lowest of the low. And think of all the mysteries. Here's the word of God being contradicted, spoken against. Here's the word of God and being fulfilled. And yet God is forsaking the precious word. Here's one who is the second person of the Trinity. And we have a difficult time enough wrapping our minds around that, don't we? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons yet one. Now, God says, it seems, that the Son is cast out. He's segregated from the three I speak as a fool here. I'm stammering. But there's a mystery. How can it be that one of the three is outside the fellowship of the three? These are all questions. And I would commend them to your pondering, not for doubt, but for faith and worship, because that's where it leads us to. That's where it's meant to lead us. God does not put questions in the Bible, even from his own son, to lead us to unbelief and speculation and say, well, we'll just throw it all away. That's what a lot of people do when they're met with the mystery of Christianity. Whether they're met with that mystery in Bethlehem or at Calvary on Easter or in a child of God who lives so differently now that they're saved, they throw it away who are unbelieving because they're saying, I need a God who's much more like me. We don't need a God who's much more like us. We need God as God. And on Calvary, behold your God. Behold your God. I move on. There's many who don't behold their God on Calvary. There's a whole congregation of them. You see him here in Psalm 22. Amazing. They're described here as animals. Some domesticated dogs, supposed to be. Maybe they're wild now. Others, bulls and lions. Whole zoo full. Whole wilderness. And they're all threatening the sun. So God forsakes the sun. The world forsakes the sun. We see this when he's crucified. As we saw last time, the Jews hand him over to the Romans. It symbolizes that the Jewish people, the religious people, and also the Romans, the cream of the crop of religion and of state, They'll have nothing to do with him. They'll cast him out of Israel's camp and out of the world. And they show by this, as they gather together, a most unlikely congregation of those who are at each other's teeth until it came to crucifying the Son. They show by this the unity of the world against God. Understand what's being drawn here. The lines are being drawn in Psalm 22. There's God on the cross in the Son, and there's two congregations 
around this segregated one. There's a congregation of those who hate the Son, despise Him, and would do away with Him. And then there's a congregation of the righteous who love the Son, which is the church of the cross. That's you, by the grace of God. Well, this congregation of the wicked, they'll stop at nothing to get rid of them. And they were that, they're described as that in, in the New Testament. But the fact that they're described here in Psalm 22 points to the fact that it's always been the case. Wherever there's a representative of God, there's going to be representatives of hell. And they're going to say, I don't like this representative of, hell, of heaven and of God. In fact, I despise him. And all the enemies of the people of God of the Old Testament were pictures of enemies from hell who were enemies of the cross. You have that. We've seen that in our series of sermons on Daniel. Ever since human beings congregated against the commandment of God who said, go into all the world and spread my, the glory of my name, and they congregated in Genesis 10 and 11 at Babel and said, we're going to make a kingdom of man and make a name for man, and God had to, dis to scatter that kingdom. Ever since then, man has been kingdom building against the king and that's psalm 2 the heathen rage and the kings of the earth they they shake their fist at the anointed of the lord and so babel and so assyria and syria and and babylon and rome and this whole world against God and seen especially on the cross because Jesus is God and in him is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And though he's being a man here crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's forsaken in the human nature as the representative of sinners, as the mediator, as the surety. He's the one they hate, the humans hate. God doesn't hate him, but humans do. Sinners. Why? Because he says in his very person, you are a sinner and you need to be right with God. I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life and there's no other way to the Father but by me. And so today you have it. In a culture that thinks it's cultured beyond the need of the cross, in a church that seems to be beyond the need of the cross, Go figure. Joins the world. And will not preach just Christ crucified. And which will have congregations with a bitter religion but a principle of man ruling. Beware. It's amazing. You see, Jesus is the name of God, the only name, the, the great name, before which every knee shall bow, but now which people despise. So people want to make a name for themselves, a name for their hero, a name for their guy is going to win the Super Bowl. They want a name for themselves and a name for anything but the name of God. This way revealed. We'll make, we'll have a God. We'll make somebody in our image. We're back to the second commandment. But we won't have that image, that express image and revelation of God. He's too God. He's too demeaning to us. He should be like someone we think we could need and we could get along with. Just give me a little bit of power. I know I'm just I'm not perfect, but just give me a little push. And I can be do good things. We don't just need a little push, beloved. 
We need one who's forsaken of God that we might never be. We don't just need an example, we need a Savior in our place who becomes an example, but is first a Savior. Lo and behold, last point here. You have answered me. That's verse 21. And I'm going to read from that. You can follow along. The last part of Psalm 22. Here's what happens to Jesus. The dogs surround him and hell itself and so on. And God's word has, has been fulfilled in all of this. God's counsel being fulfilled. The amazing thing is, from the pit of hell, that answers the prayer of the Son. As we're, we don't read of this on Calvary, that Jesus prays for deliverance, but here it is. It's going on in his mind. Deliver me. And God hears the prayer of his Son. And the answered prayer is this. Resurrection day. And after Good Friday, there's Great Sunday. And after Great Sunday, there's the great and Holy Spirit of heaven poured out because the Son is exalted to the right hand of God. And He receives the promised Spirit and He gives Himself in giving the Spirit to the church and giving the Word of God to the church. And so we have Jesus who now at and from the right hand of God is gathering and defending and preserving his church by his spirit and word and in the midst of them as he promised. And that's Psalm 22. God answers him and now he says, I will declare your name to my brethren. That's what he's doing today, right now. Jesus is declaring the name of God to the brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Jesus, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Stop there. This is Christ in the midst of the congregation, making a congregation out of good people? No. Out of the other congregation, the bulls and the wolves and the dogs. That's where we come from. This is the glory and the triumph of grace. From the one congregation, he takes his own. From the human race fallen in sins, he takes his own. And he says, you're mine now. You're another assembly, a kahal. You're a holy assembly, the true Israel of God. Don't you know it? And now Jesus is in the midst. And Jesus, just Jesus, is the focus of the people. And they love him, and they adore him, and they love his word. And they love it when the preacher preaches Jesus. Crucified and risen and coming again. And Jesus loves to preach Jesus. Because he's a shepherd. And he wants every sheep to be gathered. He's the Savior. And he wants every sinner to be gathered for whom he died for whom he was forsaken. And that's why the psalmist goes on, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over all the nations and, and so on. The great congregation, which we have become by his grace, is the worldwide congregation until every one of his own is gathered. Now, that's the crucifixion. You believe that? Do we believe that? That means we live that way. We live in Christ and crucified is the center. That's our message. And that's the fruit. Well, somebody says, well, 
This is a great congregation, it says here. Well, how do you show it? Doesn't seem very great. Doesn't seem super duper or whatever else we describe. Great things who have great influence with people. But God says it's great if it's an assembly where Jesus is in the midst. And Jesus is heard. And Jesus is preached. And Jesus is lived by. And the people of God, they show this as their fruit. They repent. And they believe. And they call others, even to the end of the world, to believe just this. At the same time, they bear a cross. And they find themselves who are gathering and believing. They're gathering around the cross and they're believing. They find themselves spit upon and mocked at and held up as on a cross just like Jesus. Because you see, the world now goes after the body. It hasn't stopped in its relentless attack upon Jesus, getting in his body, wanting the body to be divided. And to be destroyed. But Jesus will prevail. And that's what we have to remember as we press on. Don't change the message. Don't change what you want to hear. Bear fruit. Don't make a mockery of the cross by living for this world. These kinds of things. They're becoming the children of the God who forsake his son and raised him up, that we might never be forsaken, and one day raised up. Amen. Lord God, we pray, strengthen our faith in the crucified Son. Strengthen our love, Lord. Strengthen our reverence and our piety. Give good fruit, we pray. Give that we can glorify your, your Son, whom we love, whom you love. And so, so, Father, may we show we are yours in your fellowship. Gather others to our midst who are of like mind, who love you, who are glad for you, who live unto your praise. In all things we do pray, Father, in the confidence and joy of the Holy Ghost. Amen.